as you can see today Sunday 29th September when I'm making this video I'm still in Kuala Lumpur in my hotel room in my last video I said there might be difficulties getting out a video um, once given that I'm returning to London today and have a 12-hour flight and that there are problems with times well there's still some time before my flight. There is an enormous amount of news pouring in. So I thought I might as well do a video now. It should be said that this is probably not going to be as long a video as the ones that I usually do, but there it is. Anyway, let's begin. The big news is that as I rather expected, as in fact I made clear that I believed, in my previous video, um, Hassan Nasrallah, the Secretary General of Hezbollah, is indeed dead, killed in the airstrike, the massive airstrike that Israel conducted against the command bunker in Beirut, where apparently Hassan Nasrallah and other members of the Hezbollah leadership were meeting with officials of Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps. And um, Hezbollah has itself confirmed that this uh, that Nasrallah that is indeed dead, that he was killed. They haven't yet announced who his successor is going to be, but apparently a person has been lined up, um, a relative of Nasrallah's, who will apparently take over as his successor and who's been heavily involved in Hezbollah's decision making. Anyway. We haven't announced the decision as to who the successor will be. I felt myself yesterday when I did my previous program that the fact that the um, Iranian media had stopped reporting initial claims coming out of Lebanon, that Nasrallah was still alive, that they were starting to delete all of those statements, was effective confirmation that the Israeli report that Nasrallah had been killed was actually true. And then shortly after I did my program, there was a statement by the Supreme Leader of Iran, Ayatollah Khamenei, who also spoke about the situation in, Hezbo uh, in Lebanon, about the tragic losses of people in Lebanon, made strong statements criticizing Israel. But importantly, he, mentioned, he made no mention of Nasrallah at all, which reinforced my view after I saw that, after I saw those comments, that Nasrallah had indeed been killed. And killed he has been. And it must be said that this is a significant blow for Hezbollah. And in fact, now the big question, the big immediate question, beyond the question of what Iran is going to do, is what Hezbollah is going to do, and whether it will survive and hold together under this pressure. Over the last two weeks, it has been under relentless pressure from Israel. Firstly, there were the pager, and walkie-talkie attacks. Then um, there was the attacks on various members of Hezbollah's military leadership. A top Hezbollah commander who was meeting with his staff was killed. Then we got reports that another Hezbollah commander had also been killed. And now, directly after that, we get news that Hez Nasrallah himself and at least a proportion of Hezbollah's top leadership have all been killed as well. So Israel is seeking to conduct decapitation strikes. It's seeking to destroy the organization by basically destroying its leadership. Now, the question is, will this work? Will Hezbollah manage to hold together? Will it replace the leadership it has lost with the uh, with a new leadership that will ha exercise at least some of the authority that the previous leadership did? Or will it disintegrate? Will it fall apart? Now, I think that this is a question that outsiders, people who are not familiar with the organization, at least not insiders within the organization, cannot be certain of at this point in time. 
Um, it will be a major test of Hezbollah, whether it can hold together. It is, after all, a militia, not a state. Um, just to say, it's not even a regular army. So it will be a major test of its organization and discipline and the loyalty of its fighters and the various administrators that um, it employs and of its civilian base, whether following this massive blow, this deeply demoralizing blow, um, they will indeed be able to hold together and whether the organization will indeed survive. That the Iranians are worried about this strongly is strongly implied for me by various statements that they've been making and which Ayatollah Khamenei himself made. He said that Hezbollah would survive. Now that suggests that the question of whether or not it will survive, whether it will hold together, um, that that is a question that even the Iranians are not certain of. My own view, for what it's worth, having kept a distant eye on Hezbollah for some time, is that its organization and its discipline and its force will indeed hold together and that it will be able to reconstitute its leadership and that it will survive this blow. But if I were to pretend that I know this for a fact, then I would be overstating things. So that's the first thing to say. The second is, of course, whatever new leadership of Hezbollah ultimately emerges and whatever views and decisions the Iranians themselves take, it seems to me that both Hezbollah and Iran have very serious questions to ask themselves about their internal security, about the extent to which they're able to maintain internal discipline and control. Now, we've had a whole series of assassinations. The assassination of Fuad Shukr, who was one of Hezbollah's top commanders, the commander of the Hezbollah Special Forces Unit. We've had the other military commander who was also assassinated. And now we've had this massive decapitation of the top leadership of Hezbollah. All of this coming directly after the episode with the pages and the walkie-talkies that had been um, infiltrated by Israeli agents into Hezbollah and which um, exploded in ways that we all know. And this suggests that, it, well, in fact, doesn't suggest, it confirms that the Israelis have successfully penetrated um, Hezbollah's organization. Either they have managed to infiltrate agents into Hezbollah, which is, by the way, entirely possible, or in the alternative, they have broken its codes, they have managed to tap into its signals traffic, which, of course, is also possible. By the way, it's highly likely that the Israelis have done both. And, by the way, the same applies to Iran. After Ismail Haniya was assassinated in Tehran, I said that whatever explanation, whatever explanation there was for that particular assassination, however it was that it was executed, whether it was done by a bomb planted within the building or, as seems far more likely, by an external rocket fired at the hotel room where Haniya was located. It looks as if is Iranian counterintelligence, Iranian security, had failed and had failed to a significant degree. And this has come directly after a number of other missteps in Iran, of which I have to say it's not connected to these events, it's unrelated, but it still shows 
a degree of irresponsibility on the part of the people who are in charge of security for Iranian leaders. The episode of the death of the former Iranian president, Ebrahim Raizi, the fact that he was flying over mountains during difficult weather on a 50-year-old American Bell helicopter when there were far more modern, far more um, capable Russian helicopters available to transport him, which again begs the question of how exactly is security for Iranian leaders organized and whether in fact that security, that, that those problems which appeared at the time of Raiz's death, which by the way everybody accepts was due to an accident, indeed almost certainly to an, ac an accident caused by someone's negligence, whether this sloppiness has extended to much of Iran's security apparatus as well. And I have to say, I do get the feeling that there is an awful lot of that going on, and it might not be entirely improbable that if there have been security breaches, that the Iranians and Hezbollah have, well, they obviously have experienced security breaches, that this information, the information that led to the assassination of Haniye, might have been leaked or obtained by the Israelis, not just from Hezbollah, but from within Iran also. I think this is a point that it is essential to make. And I think that, as I said, Iran <laughs> and Hezbollah need to ask themselves some very, very tough questions as to why their security has failed so comprehensively over the last two weeks and take urgent steps to rectify that problem if they really want to continue to be important and serious organizations and forces in the Middle East. The fact that there have been these failures of security is going to have a significant effect on other Shia, Shia groups, militias across the Middle East. They're going to start to wonder what exactly is going on with why Hezbollah and or Iran are unable to keep their secrets and they might decide, for example, that the moment has come for them to reduce their contacts with Iranian officials or Hezbollah officials because those contacts are no longer secure. So that is an important thing to say. Now, I suspect, by the way, that what has happened is that after the 2006 war, when Hezbollah fought Israel to a standstill and gained an enormous amount of applause and support across the Middle East, I suspect that Hezbollah then became focused on the conflict in Syria. It became increasingly drawn into internal Lebanese politics. It began to lose its edge in terms of maintaining its security systems, which against an adversary as well-organized and as well-resourced and as ruthless as the Israelis have just shown themselves to be, well, that is a very, very serious mistake. So that's the, that's the next thing I feel I need to say at this particular time. And, well, beyond that, Hezbollah and Iran now need to think about what their strategy is. Do they continue to absorb all these missile and bomb strikes? Do they try to go onto the offensive in some way? Do they launch counter-strikes against Israel? What do they do? Well, we might have had the first inklings of what the initial Iranian response might be. 
And there are reports coming from Iran, well, not reports, there have been statements from um, m members of the Iranian political system that Iran is pro intending now to send troops, troops from its regular army to Lebanon, where apparently they have been based before. They were withdrawn previously, but now it's possible that they might return. So the regular Iranian army might start to establish itself in Lebanon. And, well, we'll see how the Israelis react to that and what the Iranians do if, as is highly likely, in fact all but certain, the Israelis choose to attack them. As I said, Iran might want to avoid an all-out war with Israel in the Middle East, but it seems to me that that war is drawing ever closer and we are now on the brink of it. Now, I mentioned one thing, and I think I'll just discuss it at this point, which is I mentioned that the Israelis have shown that they're well-resourced, well-organized, and extremely ruthless. The Russians have been following these events, obviously, in the Middle East, in Lebanon, this assassination of um, Nasrallah, very, very closely. And they've noticed that the Israelis have conducted what looks like a successful decapitation strike on Hezbollah, eliminating Hezbollah's senior leadership. And I'm starting to see quite a few commentaries appear on the Russian side of the internet, maybe not yet in the what one might call mainstream media in Russia, but Russian telegram channels and commentaries and places of that kind, which ask the question, why do the Israelis do these sort of things and not we? We have the means, we have the same resources, the same intelligence. We know where Zelensky and his officials are at any one time. We know where the Ukrainian general staff is located. We know where the various Western officials and advisors are located in Ukraine also. About that, by the way, I have no doubt. Why don't we respond as ruthlessly as the Israelis have done? in striking at Hezbollah. And I'm seeing quite a lot of commentary about this circulating in, um, as I said, Russian commentary chats and places like that. And I personally very much hope that Russian self-discipline and self-restraint will continue in the face of this sort of thing and that they will not be tempted into assassination and decapitation programs of the kind that Israel is currently engaging in, because I think that they are ultimately destabilizing and demoralizing and corrupting. I think that when one government goes out of its way to murder the leaders of another government or an alternative party, adversary, um, then that inevitably spreads and things can very quickly start to get out of control. Of course, Kirill Budanov, the Ukrainian intelligence chief, has said that Ukraine has already made attempts to assassinate Russian President Putin, that all of those attempts so far have been unsuccessful. Anyway, I hope that no one in Ukraine decides to try to replicate this thing because, as I said, these ideas are now circulating on the Russian internet. And for the record, I hope the Russians don't set out to do this thing as well. Now, I said that when one party in a conflict hunts around to assassinate the leaders of the other party, then that can start a chain reaction. And rather like criminal gangs that set out to eliminate the leadership, the leadership of the rival gang, <laughs> um, we could start to see something like this uh, playing out. It can easily get out of control. 
And well, up to this point in time, there's been rumors that the Iranians have considered um, assassination attempts on Iran Isra Israeli officials. Um, there's rumors that um, they've um, actually even attempted it, the, as I discussed in my previous <coughs> program. Um, uh, um, the Israelis claim that they've arrested a 70-plus-year-old man who the Iranians had recruited to try to assassinate Prime Minister Netanyahu. Um, a report which, with hindsight, I find very unconvincing, I, am, I should say. Well, now that the Israelis have conducted these assassinations, <laughs> I wonder whether things will simply stop there and whether, from now on, Israeli officials and political leaders also need to be very careful about their security and about their own movements. I say that Peter Bowman in The Guardian, as I discussed in my previous video, said that the uh, lines have now been crossed, that the uh, things that had been informally agreed that each side would not do are now happening. And, well, frankly, um, given that I think this could be a disastrous process, if it starts to play out, one which will lead to significant escalation. Well, I wonder whether we're going to see all of that, all of those things, mutual assassinations and things like that, now starting to happen. Anyway, I mention all of this. We'll see also what Israel now proposes to do. They've decapitated Hezbollah. Uh, they've conducted... Uh, assassinations of its leaders. They have exposed weaknesses in its security. But of course, if the organization survives, if it retains its coherence and discipline, and if a new leadership emerges, particularly if this new leadership understands some of these weaknesses, and it can hardly fail but to do that, and if the Iranians do start to send troops to Lebanon. Well, I have to say this, the whole situation then, from an Israeli point of view, starts to look very complicated. They will have achieved quite a lot over the first two weeks, but they cannot afford a long, grinding attrition war. In Lebanon, they've already been through that before. They went through all of that in the 1980s, as I very well remember, and 90s, and it didn't turn out well for them at all. Um, they haven't yet, so far as I can see, decided on a ground operation, though probably that is coming. <laughs> they need to be careful and probably need to consider whether, in fact, these victories that they've achieved over the last two weeks might ultimately prove ephemeral, that they wounded Hezbollah but haven't destroyed it. And of course, if Hezbollah survives, then the famous, <laughs> the famous um, line, the famous um, tag, that that which does not break you makes you stronger, well, attributed to Nietzsche. Well, that might turn out to be true. After all, it's not the first time Israel has assassinated the chief of Hezbollah. They did it 32 years ago, um, as, I remember, as I remember when it happened. And the successor was Hassan Nasrallah, who turned out to be a much more intelligent and effective and sophisticated leader than the man that he, the Israelis had assassinated and whom he had and whom he replaced. So it's not yet clear that this is a knockout blow, 
And if it is not a knockout blow, then of course the Israelis might find that their problems, in effect, are now only now starting. And I have to say that this would be consistent with the pattern of neocon wars. And I think at some level this is a neocon war because it's obvious to me that the ultimate objective of this war all along, as confirmed by Prime Minister Netanyahu's speeches, recent speeches to the US Congress and the other day to the UN General Assembly, that the ultimate objective of Prime Minister Netanyahu and his government is an all-out clash with Iran. And of course, if Iranian troops start to arrive in Lebanon, then the point of that clash, the moment for that clash, comes significantly closer. Just saying. So, we will see what the Iranians do, what the Israelis do, whether having achieved what they have, they now pull back. I hardly think that's likely, by the way. But whether they say to themselves, well, we've taken out Nasrallah, we've taken out the leadership of Hezbollah, Hezbollah is now critically wounded, this is the moment to um, stop whilst we are ahead, or will they plunge on and get themselves potentially or possibly into further trouble? I remember back in 1982, the Israelis advanced all the way to Beirut. They forced the Palestine Liberation Organization out of Beirut. They established what they thought would be a sympathetic government for themselves in Lebanon. And it all then began to fall apart. And the situation for Israel started to get go from bad to worse and became critically worse. It could be, it might be, that all of that would will recur. A neocon war, the neocon war, which is the war that neocons in the United States are promoting against, um, against Iran, have a habit of starting very strong, you know, with shock and all, and bunkers, um, blown up and opponents killed and appearance of enormous power and then they start to become bogged down and the problems get greater and it turns out that the shock and all has not proved quite as effective as it was expected to be. So there we go, a very dangerous moment in the Middle East, one which I suspect is going to become more dangerous still. I repeat my point again. I think that Israel is following the wrong course. It's taking the wrong line. Every single conflict that the Israelis have fought, I said since 1973 in a previous video, but actually since 1967, which has resulted in what the Israelis have defined as a victory has simply ended up creating a new set of security problems for Israel. And I see no reason to think that this operation is going to be any different. Anyway, there we are. That is the situation in the Middle East at the moment. That is the situation as between Iran and Israel, as far as I can judge it. The next step from Iran will be that Iranian soldiers will start to arrive in Lebanon presumably with air defense systems and all of that. And the Israelis, well, they've got important decisions to make of their own. One of which will be, as I said, to step up the security for their own leaders. Now, there is one last very intriguing mystery about these affairs. And I, it actually relates to events that have been taking place in Russia. Now, on Friday, even as reports of these massive missile strikes were, take, were appearing, uh, Israeli missile strikes on um, Lebanon, Russia's Security Council, chaired by President Putin, had a meeting. And we know that this meeting took place because there's references to it 
on the Kremlin's website. But the Kremlin has provided no indication as to what this meeting was about. If you look at who was involved in this meeting, however, it's striking that all of the intelligence and security chiefs, the heads of the SVR, the FSB, all of those, that they were all there and they were participating in this meeting. And I am fairly sure, in fact, I'm absolutely sure, that the Russians were discussing the situation in the Middle East and the current deterioration of the situation in the Middle East. Now, that in itself is not surprising. You would expect the Russians to be meeting and talking about these developments and trying to chart a course. But there was one notable absentee from this meeting, and that was the Secretary of the Security Council, Sergei Shoigu. And interestingly, Shoigu was also absent from another meeting of the Security Council that had taken place two days earlier, the meeting at which Putin announced the changes to Russia's nuclear weapons use policies. So where is he? Is he is in some form of disgrace? There have been, as we all know, various cases involving officials of the Russian Defense Ministry. Some of them have been accused of corruption. There's some kind of clear out going on in the Russian Defense Ministry. Could it be that that's all catching up with Shoigu in some way and that he himself now is in some form of disgrace? It's possible. Or is there an alternative explanation? Shoigu has been Russia's point man with the Iranians. Has he been perhaps sent to Tehran? And is he participating in the top level discussions that are taking place there? There have been instances when Russian officials have gone and visited countries that are involved in a conflict and the fact has been kept secret. To give an example, a famous example, during the 1973 October War, the Yom Kippur War, between the Arab states and Israel, the Soviet Prime Minister, Alexei Kosygin, flew to Egypt, where he had meetings with President As uh, Sadat and senior officials of the Egyptian government. It was all kept very, very secret. Uh, Kosygin, incidentally, didn't get on with Sadat at all and basically hauled Sadat over the coals for mismanaging the war. But that's another story. Is it possible that Shoigu is doing the same thing, that he's been sent by the Kremlin on a secret mission to um, Tehran and that he is reporting back to Moscow and that the Security Council was readout we have not seen, we haven't been provided with a readout, that they're getting regular reports now from Shoigu in Tehran, with Shoigu perhaps participating in the discussions that the Iranian leaders are engaging in. It would not surprise me at all. I cannot say, of course, that that is indeed what has happened because I have no information one way or the other. Anyway, in the meantime, as all of this is going on, President Biden has now followed in the footsteps of his Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, and he has, in effect, backed and forcibly backed the Israeli assassination of Hassan Nasrallah. I personally find this a uh, unwise thing to do, but that is what um, Biden has done. Um, the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, who is currently in New York, has commented on this. He said that the fact that the Americans seem to be happy with the fact that people get assassinated in this kind of fashion, well, that tells you all you need to know about the way in which the Americans conduct their foreign policy. Anyway, he's, he's already been making statements to that effect. Now, 
Lavrov hasn't only been talking about the situation in the Middle East. He's giving warnings, as we might all expect, that the situation is now heading fast towards an all-out war. He's criticizing the Americans. The Russians, by the way, have unequivocally condemned the assassination of Hassan Nasrallah, as have most states out, uh, around the world, by the way, as far as I know, outside the West. Anyway, um, <laughs> Um, sure, uh, Lavrov hasn't only been talking about that. He has also been talking about the Brazilian Chinese initiative, uh, the meeting um, which took place in on the fringes of the General Assembly, where the Chinese and the Brazilians uh, brought together um, various countries from the global south. It turned out that the number of attendees was 18, not 17. No European or Western country was invited to participate, but France and Hungary sent observers. One country which I noticed did participate in this meeting, did send a representative, was Kenya, which is interesting because Kenya is normally a US ally. Anyway, they were there, and the participants at this meeting, all 18 of them, then signed off on a joint statement. And the joint statement basically refer references back to the Chinese-Brazilian statement that was made back in May. They say the Brazilian-Chinese statement of May talks about the need for an international peace conference drawn up in a fair and balanced way at which both the Russians and the Ukrainians attend for that to be set up. It talks about the need for negotiations between the Ukrainians and the Russians to move towards a position where such a peace conference can take place. Um, it talks about the need for de-escalation. I said that um, de-escalation is code for a cessation of Western arms supplies to Ukraine. Well, it talked about that too. It did not, interestingly enough, talk about a ceasefire, but it did speak about the fact that any agreement any peace agreement between Ukraine and Russia should be just and sustained and should be based on the principles of the UN Charter. Now, Lavrov has made some comments about this, and they're actually very interesting. And um, they are more relaxed, I should say, or so, so they came across to me, than comments that Lavrov um, has made before about peace initiatives made by the uh, Brazilians and the Indians specifically. And he said this, he said amongst other things, he said this, each time an agreement Russia always goes for with Ukraine is derailed, Ukraine shrinks. <laughs> Lavra, and then he went on to uh, remind everybody that uh, Ukraine's refusal to implement the Minsk agreements and uh, Kiev's disruption of the negotiations in 2022 were examples. And he again reminded everybody that there'd been what looked like an agreement in between Russia and Ukraine in 2022. And no less a person than David Arachamia, the uh, chief Ukrainian delegate then confirmed that it had been Boris Johnson that had advised the Ukrainians to pull out of the agreement that had been reached in 2022 in Istanbul. And then Lavrov made some very interesting points. He says, if Ukraine continues along the same path, if it continues to use some gimmicks again in order to buy time, it will not succeed. Ukraine has forever undermined its legitimacy, at least as long as the current regime is in power. A hint, a very clear hint, 
that the Russians are looking for regime change in, um, in Ukraine. And then he went on to say, this is Lavrov, I very much hope that our Chinese and Brazilian friends and all those who have joined this group of friends of peace will fully take into account the manners and ways of the current Ukrainian leadership and its endless attempts to lure everyone by deception on their very quick and shifting sand. And uh, then Lavrov also discussed <laughs> Trump's ideas. He said Trump said some time ago that he would need 24 hours. Now the wording is different. We will welcome any initiatives that will bring about the desired result. And there can be only one result, a settlement of the problem on the basis of eliminating the root causes of the Ukrainian crisis. And then Lavrov went on to say, um, among these root causes, there is the threat to Russia's security from the West, which has been dragging Ukraine into NATO. While security is essential, not a sub abstract term, but as a basic human need. Another root cause is the discrimination against the Russian speaking population, including through laws banning the use of the Russian language and even the canonical Orthodox Church. And then um, Lavrov went on to say, if um, Mr. Trump succeeds in overturning these laws, we're talking about it will be a stride forward. It's the easiest thing to do. Just hold a vote. Our position is crystal clear. We need to eliminate the root causes of the conflict. Everyone knows what they are. And then he reminded everybody that Zelensky has also published a decree prohibiting negotiations with Russia. Uh, President Zelensky's decree prohibiting negotiations with Russia is still in force, so I'm not even going to speculate on how they're going to sort things out. So all of that was said by Lavrov in response to this meeting that took place, as I said, on the fringes of the General Assembly session. Now note that the Russians are not giving an inch. They insist that their red lines, their conditions, the basis upon which they um, um, began the special military operation, that they must be satisfied in full. Um, there must obviously be acceptance by Ukraine, a further loss of territory, the four regions as well as Crimea. Uh, Ukraine must agree not to become a member of NATO and must agree to remain a neutral country. Ukraine must also lift all its restrictions on the Russian population, use of the Russian language. It must end its persecution of the Russian Orthodox Church. And last but not least, it must also revoke its decree, which prohibits negotiations with the Russians. Without that, negotiations can't get beyond first base anyway. So why are we even talking about this? But he didn't slam the door on the Brazilians and the Chinese, or indeed the Indians, and he didn't slam the door on Donald Trump. He basically said to Trump, look, if you can come up with ideas that will satisfy all of these concerns that you have, well, we will certainly, we will certainly pay attention and we will try to the extent that we can without compromising our position or our vital interests seek to work towards you. And then, of course, when he talks about the Ukrainian regime having lost legitimacy, how it is constantly trying to lure people into the quicksand of negotiations, which it has no real intention of following through upon, well, you can see that Lavrov, at least, is clearly thinking about regime change. Anyway, there we are. It's an interesting statement from Lavrov, far more sophisticated and intelligent than the statements that have come from Zelensky and from Blinken. Both have been scathing about this Brazilian-Chinese uh, initiative. Um, Zelensky, well, I've already spoken about him, but apparently he repeated all of his criticisms all over again. And Blinken 
incredibly critical of China, say, saying how can China support peace in Ukraine when it is arming Russia and supporting Russian aggression. Uh, completely unhelpful things, which, as the Chinese, of course, point out, uh, I mean, the same applies, or at least, in fact, they deny that they're supplying arms to the Russians, but they point out that that is exactly what the what Blinken is complaining about, which they say then the Chinese say they're not doing, is exactly what the United States is doing, given that it is supplying arms to Ukraine. By the way, on this issue, I ought to say that back in the 1970s, at the time of the Vietnam War, the United States did not take this kind of absolutist position. Both the Soviet Union and China were arming the North Vietnamese. And so far from getting into a rage over it, the United States at that time was pursuing detente with those countries. It was not imposing sanctions upon them and threatening them in the way that the United States is doing now. So why China, which quite openly supplied arms to uh, Vietnam, North Vietnam, in the 1970s, led at that time, of course, by Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai, why that was something that the US wasn't bothered about then, why it's so much more serious today, when it's probably, by the way, not happening, at least not in the way that the Americans say. Well, I'll leave that to international affairs analysts and commentators and historians to work out. But anyway, there we are. Let's, let's move on. Now, um, what about the situation on the battlefronts? Because, as I've said many times, this continues to be what shapes the ultimate situation um, in Ukraine. Now, I think the first thing to say, to repeat again before I move forward, is that just as the Ukrainians, in my opinion, came to understand in July of this year that they were going to lose the war, if the war continued in the way that it is doing, they were going to lose, that they cannot stop the Russians or defeat the Russians on the battlefield. And Ukrainian policy ever since has basically been to try and find other means to achieve Ukraine's objectives, not military means, but means that involve either getting the West directly involved in the war, that seems to be the preferred option, or alternatively to peel away Russia's friends and isolate Russia and put overwhelming diplomatic pressure on the Russians in order to get them to capitulate. And of course, we've also had episodes like the Kursk incursion and the attacks on Russian facilities inside Russia and things like that. Well, anyway, just as the Ukrainians came to understand in July that they cannot defeat the Russians in a conventional war, the Western powers have now come to the same conclusion. They too understand, they, they are aware, at least at some level, about the real situation on the battlefronts, on the battlefields in Ukraine at the moment. They know that Ukraine is losing. We've just seen that there's been articles by Owen Matthews in The Spectator, uh, an, uh, an editorial, a, a comment piece about this in The Economist. There's been articles also appearing, many articles actually, in The New York Times. There was the article by David Ignatius in The Washington Post about Ukraine bleeding out. Anyway, they all understand now that Ukraine is losing the war, and they also understand that in conventional military terms, there is effectively nothing that the West can do to turn the situation round. That there is no arms package available 
new weapons that the West can send to Ukraine that are going to reverse this slide, that only a direct intervention by the West might have any chance of doing something like that. And perhaps, given the size of the Russian army now, even that would be too risky. And of course, Western public opinion, the Western public would never agree to it. And there would be enormous risks of a nuclear escalation as well. So there is a general acceptance across the West that the war is being lost. And this is affecting decision making. It explains why people are more and more reluctant to send money and more weapons to Ukraine. It's why the, there's even more resistance now mounting against the $50 billion loan that the Ukrainians have been promised. It's a critically important reason why Zelensky has returned to Ukraine from his trip to the United States empty-handed. But even as there is general agreement that the war is lost, there is no diplomatic initiative, no real idea about how, what to do to reverse or slow the disaster or to reach some kind of agreement with the Russians of the kind that I discussed in my previous video that would at least mitigate the defeat that is coming, the defeat that Aurelien described so well in that piece he's written on Substack, which I discussed in my previous video. On the contrary, uh, as Brian Belletic has correctly said in his very latest video, if you look at the kind of statements Western officials are making, state statements made by people like Biden and Kamala Harris and Blinken and Sullivan, and of course, comments made by in Germany by Olaf Scholz, by the European Commission, by the British government. Well, they're basically at the moment telling the Ukrainians, well, you know, we may not be able to give you all the help you want, but, you know, you should just go on fighting. We're 100% with you. Just go on fighting. And well, it might all turn out well, after all. That's, it seems to me, what mostly they are saying at this time, which seems to me most astonishing. But anyway, what is going on on the battlefronts? Well, apparently there's been more Russian missile and bombing strikes across Ukraine, but I'm not able to discuss the details of all of that because I don't have it. But it does seem that the um, Russians are continuing their advances. Uh, north of Vugladar. Vugladar itself remains surrounded and there's been no more news about what is going on within Vugladar uh, since I did my previous program. As I said, the military summary channel thinks that the Russians are trying to persuade the Ukrainian troops in Vugladar to surrender. I think on the contrary that there is a massive map mopping up operation going on, that the Russians now have complete control of all of the boundaries around Vugladar and probably all the strong points, but that there are there is spirited resistance going on by courageous, in my opinion, misguidedly courageous Ukrainian soldiers from the 72nd Brigade fighting on in the ruins. But the Russians are clearing the town out. And that's why they're not giving us any information about this, because that is what the Russians do. Anyway, I think all of that is going on. And um, in time, eventually, it may take a couple of days, might take a week or so, might even take a bit longer than that. But eventually, we will suddenly discover that the Russian Defense Ministry is reporting the complete fall of Vugladar. I think there will be prisoners. In fact, there already are some, apparently. But my sad view is that the nature of the fighting in Vugladar is that the majority of the soldiers who are fighting there, the Ukrainian soldiers who are fighting there, are tough, courageous and highly motivated soldiers, and that they will do what they have been ordered, which is fight to the end. I, I don't like to think about that, but I think that that is what is going to happen. Anyway, elsewhere, 
further north, <laughs> um, the Russians appear to have gained a significant amount of territory south of Selidovo. And as I discussed, um, there are now the first reports that they've entered and are fighting for Tsukurinye, the village to the south of Selidovo. And they're also advancing north of Selidovo as well. And, well, the mapping projects have provided large blocks of territory, which they've colored in red, and which they claim that the Russians have now captured south and north of Selidovo. Um, I'm not again able to discuss all of this. I suspect some of this territory the Russians have already controlled for quite a long time. But anyway, it's clear that intense fighting is going on north and south of Selidovo, and this town is now being definitely encircled. And I say encircled, the Russians have taken it into a semicircle, but they don't need to go all the way around to establish a circle around Selidovo. They're still going to be able, so it seems to me, to interfere with any road and rail links that lead into Selidovo with their FPV drones, their mortars, their bombs. And of course, these Orion drones, the Russian equivalent of the Predators and the Reapers, which are now becoming very common across the battlefronts. The Russian Defense Ministry is publishing more and more videos of these drones in operation. Further sign, by the way, that the Ukrainian defense system has effectively collapsed, air defense system has essentially collapsed, that they're not able to shoot down these drones, and these drones are now flying over the roads, the supply roads and the railway lines, and they're able to choke off very effectively supplies into Selidovo, into the garrison at Selidovo, which is, in my opinion, going to face a supply crisis very soon. And as I discussed in my previous video, the same will also be true of Kurachovo fairly quickly. And, well, there's been news that the Russians have captured, or at least are in the process of capturing, the village of Suhe Yar, northwest of Novogrodivka and Lisivka as well. Apparently fighting is now going on there. I discussed in my program yesterday how the Russians control, appear to have captured the village of Mikhailovka, south of um, Mirnograd. There's been lots of film uh, now published by the Russian Defense Ministry showing the storming, by the, the successful storming by the Russian army of, Mik of, Mik of this village of, Mik of uh, Nikolaevka. And the Russians, apparently they've only got one fortification left before they reach Mirnograd itself. <clears throat> and as I said in my previous video, I expect they will capture that um, particular um, fortify, fortification, basically just a line of trenches <laughs> at some point within the next couple of hours or days. So that's one battle that's going on, that's fighting out um, the Pakrovsk, Vuglada, Kurachovo areas. Just to repeat again, point I've made many times, the fighting in all of these areas needs to be understood as fighting that's taking place over the course of one giant battle. It's, these are different places, different locations that are being fought over. But ultimately, when this battle ends, at some point over the next few weeks, certainly before the end of the year, of that I'm sure, we will recognize it as one great battle that is being fought out and in which the Russians have the overwhelming advantage. Now, the mapping projects have also provided a great deal of information about the situation in Toretsk over the last 24 hours. And they have colored large blocks of Toretsk in red, clearly pointing to either major Russian advances in Toretsk or alternatively, um, 
confirming that the Russians have already been advancing far deeper into Toretsk than people have been aware of. I'm going to guess that something like a third to 40 percent of this town is now under Russian control. Now, that may not sound like um, all of it, you know, particularly impressive, but I'm talking about the town of Torets now, not about the larger Torets conurbation, which includes towns like New York and the other big villages that were located there, Zaliznye, uh, <laughs> Druzhba, all of those. If you put all that together, then I reckon the Russians now control around 70% of the total conurbation. And again, looking at these large blocks of red that the mapping projects have just covered their maps with in Toretsk, it seems to me as if this battle also for Toretsk is now also close to coming to its end. So that's Toretsk. There's been no news over the last 24 hours from Chasov Yar. Again, I predict that we're going to discover, much like with Toretsk, that the Russians have moved very far in Chasov Yar as well. I've been saying this for some time. And we've had no news from Siversk. There's lots of reports in Kupiansk that the Russians launched another an armored advance towards the Oskol River but that they were repelled by Ukrainian troops located on the west, uh, east bank of the Oskol River and that a large number of armoured vehicles, Russian armoured vehicles, were destroyed um, over the course of the fighting. Well, that may very well be true. We have exactly that story um, some months ago about Terny and we've seen how much difference in the end it made. And there are reports, further reports today, that the Russians um, are now fighting inside Sverdlikovo in Kursk area and in Plekhovo, the two villages. And for the record, I think, I, I, I suspect there's a very good chance that the, the Ukrainians are going to try to hold on to these two villages with everything they've got that the Russians might indeed succeed in capturing them, though it might take them some time to do so. At which point, the entire Ukrainian grouping in Kursk will be, in effect, operationally encircled. It won't be trapped in the way that the Ukrainian troops in Vugladar are trapped, but it will not be that different. And as I said, with the rains closing in and movement within the Kursk pocket becoming all but impossible, I think a nightmare is facing, is, is looming over the horizon for the Ukrainian troops there. Well, there we are. That is my program for today. As I said, somewhat shorter than my usual programs. We've had this enormous news from the Middle East. I ultimately, as I said in my program yesterday, I think in terms of long-term consequences for the world, the conflict in Ukraine continues to be the more important one in the sense that it would shift the balance of power in Europe. I saw that Prime Minister Netanyahu is now claiming that the death of Nasrallah has shifted the balance of power in the Middle East in Israel's favour. Well, that might be so, <laughs> but it might also be putting too much weight on the importance of one single individual. Whereas, of course, if we're talking about Europe, a Russian victory on the Ukrainian battlefields is going to be massively consequential. Now, what the West is going to do about that, what the Russians are going to do about that, what the Ukrainians are going to do, 
that I'm going to discuss in future programs. And in the meantime, the Middle East is now closer to war, all out war, than it has been, in my opinion, at any time since the 1982 crisis, the crisis between uh, the PLO and Israel, between Israel and Syria. I so clearly remember, by the way, the enormous confidence with which Israel began its advance into Lebanon in 1982 and how it eventually turned out. I'm not saying it's going to be exactly the same this time. It never is. But who knows? Anyway, um, <laughs> we will see what happens in the Middle East. In 1982, as I remember, we got fairly close at one point to a potential clash between the Americans and the Russians, because the Russians at that time were rushing air defense systems to Syria, and their personnel were there. And there was some talk of the Americans attacking those air defense systems in Syria. Um, that was in 1982. Thankfully, it never came to anything like that. But anyway, a very, very major crisis developing in the Middle East, in some ways more dangerous, I think, than the one in 1982. And we will see how things play out. Well, that's my program for today. Next time, my next program will be made from London. Until then, have a very good day. To remind you one last time, you can check all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Don't forget also that um, you can um, support our work uh, by going to our shop and last but not least if you've liked this video please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel that's me for today more from me soon have a very good day